I wanted to start uh, by asking you which part of the world you worried most about. Well, the world's a, you know, it's a messy, divergent, kind of dark place, as it, as it typically is. And I think that um, there's uh, lots to worry about. Uh, I think the bigger things that matter or the things that I worry about most about now are not things that you, I wouldn't start with a country or region. As the guy mentioned, Till mentioned too. Uh, you know, we're coming out of the, we're coming, at least parts of the world coming out of this crisis um, still pretty damaged and pretty fragile. And one of the costs of the crisis was uh, we eroded pretty dramatically in big parts of the world. A lot of the classic cushions we rely on governments and central banks rely on to mitigate the effects of shocks and recessions. So even if you take the view that, um, which I think is justified, that the world today doesn't, doesn't feel like, doesn't have the mix of vulnerabilities, anything like what we faced uh, globally in 07 or we faced in the emerging economies in the late 90s, we have a different kind of risk, which is we have a world that is uh, at least where large parts of the world economy have less room to adjust policy in response to even more modest shocks. Uh, I think that's worth, worth worrying about. It's not true for every region or country. I mean, the US has got plenty of room. China's got plenty of room for maneuver. But obviously, Europe has less room. Japan has less room. Uh, emerging economies, on average, have a little more room, too. But it's, it's sort of a different thing. Uh, so I, I, would, I, would, I would make that one general observation. Can I just make one other? Uh, I think the other, you know, much of economics uh, in terms of what matters in the extreme event is about the capacity of political institutions uh, to deliver uh, sense of sensible policies, either in response to the acute risk or the more corrosive risk that build up over time. And, you know, that capacity looks weak uh, in so many parts of the world. And it looks like it's under a huge amount of stress still in lots of parts of the world where growth has been very, very, very weak. And you know, one of the costs of not just a crisis this acute, but a period of um, you know, very weak growth uh, uh, in many parts of the world is, is uh, puts a lot more pressure uh, on those political systems. And uh, many of those institutions and systems were already looking pretty weak relative to the challenges they face. So those are two general observations I, I would make. Um, Let, let's explore start, both of dark. those, because um, they're both really interesting ways of thinking about the world now. But before we do so, are you, if, if I had said to you in, the autumn of 2008, so before we knew how cataclysmically the US economy was tumbling, but after the uh, Lehman. And I'd said to you, and I'd painted a description of the world today, and I'd said by the first quarter of 2015, this is what the world would look like. Um, would you have taken that to have been a good outcome or a not so good outcome? You know, it's hard because you're, you're asking, um you're, you're testing, you're asking me to go back and say, you know, what do we really think? And my, my, main, view, my main recollection of that period was just the, the sense of the abyss. And it was so hard to look beyond the abyss. And that, that acute sense of concern that, of course, I felt, many of us felt that we didn't know if we were going to be able to get through it and prevent, the, prevent a kind of Great Depression-like set of outcomes. So in many ways, scarred by this experience, for the U.S., I would say, uh, you know, I feel like uh, I like our challenges. I think our challenges are better challenges than those facing almost any meaningful country around the world. And they're, in some ways, a better set of challenges, or put it differently, I think in a, in a relative sense, our, our economy, I think, is in a stronger position today than, than it was in the decade before the crisis, you know, where much of what seemed good about the economy was artificial and sustainable. I think fundamentally, it's a, it's a better economy today. And relative to um, the major economies, it's a, it's a in a much stronger relative position, too. That's a relative judgment, of course. Uh, so I think in, in that sense, uh, we have a lot to feel reasonably confident about as Americans. You know, of course, we still face all the challenges we had going into the crisis. The crisis exacerbated many of those, a lot of leftover damage, and a lot to worry about as a country. But they're pretty lucky challenges to have, to have as a country relative to what, what, what many of our uh, counterparts around the world face. Well, I want to get on to your, your counterparts, but we early, in an earlier panel this morning, we had Jason Furman and Olivia Blanchard talking about, um, we were talking about the strength of the US relative to the rest of the world, 
We were, well, actually, I raised the comparison with the late 1990s. Um, and there, um, you know, there was a concern that the US economy couldn't fly on one engine. Is that something that worries you now? It clearly worried you in the late 1990s. Does it worry you now that the world is relying too much on the US? Obviously, it'd be better for the world if there was a little more diversity of strength. But, you know, the emer to take a slightly more optimistic view of that, I think the, you know, the emerging, the emerging market economies, of course, collectively are a much mar larger share of GDP. And even if their average growth rates are somewhat lower than that period of time, or lower than the, at least the decade that followed the 90s, uh, because they're so much larger as a share of the economy, they're still a, a very substantial source of growth. And I think, you know, with a, like a reasonable view over time, they're going to grow two or three times the rate of the major economies, not individually. And not consistently necessarily, but as a group on average over time. So that helps a little bit, um, helps offset some of the sources of weakness in, in the world economy. You know, the world, the world is, the world tends to do relatively well when you're, even if you're, even with disappointments about how fast countries are growing, as long as you're avoiding the acute, like, adverse tail. Great Depression-like outcomes that uh, we've seen periodically across across the world, and if, of course, we have some parts of the world that seem vulnerable to those today, but many parts of the world are less vulnerable to those kind of things than they were. I mean, just think about the emerging economies in the, in the decades before today. I mean, you know, they were they were largely overcome at appalling frequency with uh, you know, the, the one of the horsemen of the apocalypse for the emerging market economies, which is you know, terribly bad exchange rate management, serially bad monetary policy resulting in you know, hyperinflation, fiscal profligacy and vending you know, resulting in serial defaults, uh, or you know, banking systems really run, um, you know, run terribly. And you know, th those, you know, again, there's some pockets of the emerging world that are pretty challenged in that sense, but they're really the exception today rather than the rule. And, that means that those outcomes as a, as a whole in, in one of the most populous, most rapidly growing parts of the world uh, have somewhat less risk of that really extreme adverse. Let's, let's talk about the most, uh, the most important country in the emerging world, which is China, where you, know, you mentioned it just now as a country that was doing well. Um, another way of looking at China is saying that the increase in China's debt since 2007 is uh, of a magnitude that, whatever it is, 100% of GDP, um, no country has had that scale of increase of debt without having a financial crisis. So just a sort of simple extrapolation of history suggests that maybe they are in, about to have a financial crisis. And what is it that makes you upbeat about them? And I, I, one can tell a story that they had a huge credit-driven boom and it's surely got to end in tears. Yeah, I mean, they're going through a set of transitions I think no country has successfully navigated before. It's not just coming off a huge boom in credit. Um, at the same time, you're, doing, you're going through a period of financial deregulation, you're opening up your capital account, and you're, you're uh, going through a you know, pretty powerful slowdown, basic drivers of growth. You're trying to redirect growth to a more productive market. So it's a pretty upbeat? challenging set of things. Uh, but I, I would say that you could still have a, um, be realistic and have a fair amount of confidence in them. And you know, they, they have uh, you know, very high rates of savings, the boom was largely financed in their own currency. Not completely, but largely financed in their own currency. There's no risk they're gonna lose control over their exchange rate. Their uh, financial system is still overwhelmingly a system that's uh, guaranteed and run by the state. Just got some inefficiencies in that, but if you're worried about runs and panics in a country like that, it's somewhat a diminished risk. And I think if you look at what they've done, in these uh, last 18 months or so to try to mitigate the most acute risks of this huge boom in financing, much of which happened outside the banking system, they've been very deft and very careful about how they've tried to uh, uh, move that pretty unstable source of finance to a little more stable foundation. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I have uh, a lot of confidence in the, in the people that seem to have the economic reins of, of um, or at least the year of the leaders there on the economic side. They're, they're, very, they're very talented people, and they have the benefit of watching 
the mistakes countries around the world have made with some distance. That doesn't mean they won't repeat them, but they have a pretty good chance of it. One, one country they're sometimes compared to is one that you know very well from your early career, which is Japan. And there's a, an argument that actually they look a lot like Japan in the mid to late 1980s. And they're poorer than Japan was then, but basically a sort of years of an investment binge, um, you know, debt is in their own currency, huge asset bubble. Do you think those parallels are accurate? And if so, do they, is there a risk that they face a Japan-like future? Well, it's, it's worth noting for just a little context in Japan. You know, we tend to take a kind of a dark view of Japan. Uh, most people look at Japan over the last 20 years are, are pretty critical of their performance. But if you looked at per capita income growth in Japan, you know, they had a shrinking labor force, shrinking population. They've had uh, pretty impressive rates of per capita income growth. That's an important because, you know, for many people, um, have, you know, they're a very productive economy, uh, not, not maybe at the frontier of efficiency in every place, but they're pretty close in lots of places. So that's just a bit of a comparison. You, know, you, could, be, you could do a lot of worse. Uh, a lot of people Most say, people don't think of Japan as having been a massive economic success story of the last two. No, but uh, think about how you measure it. I'm, just, I'm not defying graph. I mean, just, just, just think about it. Think about you know they've had, very, you know, very low employment, very high rates of employment. They're a very productive economy, pretty good productivity growth, and they've had very, you know, relatively pretty good uh, per capita growth at a time when large parts of the world economy and developed worlds could not could not claim that. So, you know, people often ask me. They say, um, well, gee, is there some risk that Europe? Uh, will be like Japan, and you know, uh, sometimes I say they should be so lucky. Uh, it would be, it's a, it's a, there are many aspects of that would be the envy of many economies in Europe in that period of time. So uh, China, how is China different? Um, I'd say China is different uh, in, you know, potentially different in, 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 you know, in two respects. One is, I think even relative to Japan in the 80s, you know, they're, uh, they've got much more room to take advantage of that basic arbitrage of applying technology uh, to improve productivity. Now, the productivity growth in China is not going to be like it, what it was in the last two decades, but it's likely to be much faster than countries, uh, countries like Japan operating more at the frontier for some time. And you know, in, in many ways, uh, China is a, yeah, it's, it's still a, um, it's a very uh, state-dominated economy where there's still a lot of control, basic control over basic inputs into production, cost of labor, energy, capital. Uh, but you could think about two different ways. You could say, gee, that's a kind of a challenging economy to generate efficient growth out of. On the other hand, you could say, there's much more room mm -hmm. to improve the basic performance of the economy. And even despite that, China has, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to sound like, so I'm, you're making me sound too optimistic, but. Uh, dis, uh, even despite that, China has you know tremendously competitive, tremendously dynamic, tremendous on entrepreneurial drive in parts of the economy where the level of competition competition uh, is uh, is you know remarkable in ways that are pretty good for innovation. Let's um, turn briefly to Europe, where you famously went to try and convince them to do the right thing. Where did you go? Cracker or somewhere, and the Europeans were rather unhappy about it. I went that. to Europe many, many times. Yes, but there was one famous one where you went and they got very cross about you coming to see them. But uh, now, um, what would you, were you to go back there now and tell them what to do, uh, what would you say? And will Greece, is Greece's future in the Euro or not? Just as a side note, um, at, at that event you're referring to, uh, they um, they asked me to come. Uh, I'm sorry, they did ask, and then ungraciously <laughs> generally, they got cross about you. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't really them as a whole. Uh, generally, I don't like to get on a plane unless it's some you know obvious thing. Uh, so Europe, you know, yeah, yeah Europe is um, is I think the most challenging mix of things that matter because it's of a scale uh, anywhere still and. Uh, you know, they've just got a terribly tough long road ahead of them. And uh, even the best case, most optimistic view of what's possible uh, is going to result in pretty limited and, and, and very um, fragile and very divergent uh, growth trends around there. Uh, so it's hard. Um, you know, people tend to look at what the choices Europe made in their crisis, and they look at what we made, and they look at that contrast, and they, and they say appropriately it favors us. because. We adopted a dramatically different strategy, dramatically different strategy, and had 
dramatically different results. But that's a sort of unfair comparison, you know, because we had um, we had strengths Europe doesn't have. Uh, we had a capacity to make decisions they didn't have. Um, but more importantly, Europe had to worry about a very complicated set of uh, you know balances because you know they're they're trying to provide some protection against catastrophic risk without undermining the incentive to reform in parts of Europe need to reform. And that dynamic, that negotiation, is a, is a much more, we, we face nothing like that. And that's a, it's a hard thing. And so a lot of the strategy they adopted, which in contrast to what we did, looks, looks much more tentative, much more gradual. Uh, you know, a lot of breaks where there should have been accelerator uh, was the function of that very different challenge where they're, they have to be worried much more about the incentives they're creating for governments around Europe. So I, I, I make that comparison with, with some sympathy. Uh, I, I, I don't know what the uh, future of Europe is. I do think that um, the leaders of Europe, the ones that we think of as holding the key to how this unfolds, you know, those with uh, financial power and resources, yeah, I mean. they're, they're Europeans, at least this leadership, are very, very supportive of the, of the, of the, of the EMU and Monetary Union and are very committed to it. And I think they've had a lot of opportunity the last four years to contemplate the possibility of the alternative, and they haven't found it very attractive. Uh, Is there a risk, though, that we, we worried um, a couple of years ago about financial contagion? If you know, if Greece in 2010 or 2012 had been kicked out of the euro, there was a financial contagion risk. Is there now a political contagion risk that decisions made over Greece now will affect Podemos? They'll affect other parties' prospects, and that therefore you have to think about. The, Im the knock-on impact in a different way than you used to. Of course, but of course, but and it, but I think that was true from the beginning. Uh, again, because they're they're trying to this is oversimplifies a little bit, but you know they're trying to provide uh, enough of a, enough protections that the monetary union you know, hangs together, that you know bank systems can fund, governments can fund, uh, economies have some chance and some oxygen to grow in that context. But they they need to preserve a balance of pretty powerful incentives across across the continent, really, in terms of um, reform. And that's that's about. Um, so if you want to call that the inverse of contagion, you can do it that way. So so right right now, uh, of course, what matters is, and it's very important that when they're trying to figure out how they resolve this complicated balance sheet thing. They do so in a way that doesn't uh, have what you might call negative contagion in terms of the incentives it creates. I kind of feel like the the incentive is going to be positive because you know governments who are making these choices across Europe today, you know they they have the the great example that they can live with. Hopefully they've got long enough time horizon to do that and saying uh, Greece made a different set of choices. Do we, does that path look compelling? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think about Argentina today. I mean, it's not, like, not, not a great example, but think about Argentina today. Yeah, there's been some, you might call adverse contagion for people who found that attractive model, but I think most of the reaction has been the adverse. Uh, most people look at that today and, and they find it a, um, a much more stigmatized, much less appealing model for how you run economic policy. I, 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 I don't that sound impolite. I don't mean to be impolite. I think it's just a fact. Do you think that, there's one last question on Europe, that they are, you, you mentioned that they had adopted a very different strategy to the US. They're in a very different place. And perhaps that was an unfair comparison. But are they where they are today because of a particular set of choices? And they could have been somewhere different had they made a different set of choices. So is, is the current mess avoidable? Oh, well, I think it was going to be very hard to come out of it without a long period of relatively weak growth. But I think it's I think it's uh, weaker than it needed to have been. Uh, you know, people think that people tend to think that the uh, dominant choice that is responsible for a set of growth outcomes that were weaker than were desirable was the result of the adoption of um, the sort of early excessive embrace of austerity, where you didn't need to do it. And you know, there's definitely something to that. But think think of the other, the other strategy that was adopted, even in the service of the getting better incentives for the reformer. The other strategy that was adopted was to um, allow the allow the system to live at the edge of uh, collapse for some time, and that resulted in a uh, 
tightening of financial conditions and risk premium that were very, very punitive in terms of the effect on growth. And in some ways, the effects of that may have been worse in terms of, in terms of the worse than actual yeah. fiscal austerity on what happened to growth. And both those things were avoidable. And both those choices, and those, they were choices. Those, both those adopt, uh, resulted in a, you know, a, a, deeper, a deeper collapse uh, and a much slower road and a, and a much more fragile uh, recovery and a, a, much more, a much more dramatic polarization of political conditions in Europe than, than might have been the result, might have been um, necessary. Uh, I'm going to open to questions in just a second, but I just want to touch on one other topic before then, which is the financial system and financial regulation uh, here. You, in your book, um, argued, quote, against Old Testament vengeance. And I wondered whether you saw any evidence of that in the way that the financial sector had been treated. I think there's a lot to the Old Testament. Uh, but <laughs> I, 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 was, I was just trying to make the observation that... Um, that in a systemic financial panic, in a classic run in a financial system, uh, the kind of responsible uh, moral obligation of people governing is to uh, reduce the risk of Great Depression, like economic outcomes, mass unemployment, uh, you know, 20%, 5% fall in GDP. And that requires, as the first obligation of policymakers, not the only one, but the first obligation to make sure that you not just put out the financial fire, but restructure, recapitalize the system and have a level of public demand to offset the contraction and private demand that's sustained long enough that you can heal the damage. And uh, I think that has to be at the higher top of the hierarchy of policymakers in the face of a financial panic. And, that's a, and that results in a bunch of difficult choices that look, they seem unfair, but they're more fair than putting the economy or the financial system through the risk of the Great Depression. And most of what determines how countries fare coming out of financial crises like this, panics, is, is, that, is that type of choice they make. And the, the instinct of the typical policymaker faced with the financial panic is to wait and not take any risk or to, um, in a kind of Old Testament sense, hope that the fire will consume the the venal, without affecting the fortunes of the average America, average person. And that belief is at the heart of why most countries uh, you know, suffer much more prolonged economic downturns than they should in the face of a financial panic, if you, at least you're a country with the strength of the United States. So that, I mean, I'm, I'm making more complicated your simple, concise uh, summary of that. And uh, once the panic has subsided, so the US is now through that, has the ex-post response in terms of New financial regulation. Has it gone too far? The system has that gone too far? Um, the, the, you know, I'm, I'm kind of burdened by all these choices we made. I think that uh, we left a lot of unfinished business and a lot of uh, challenges ahead in, in financial reform. Um, you know, we left in place a, a really complicated oversight structure, ridiculously complicated, more complicated than any anyone on the planet, and much more than it needs to be, which is a big source of complexity and design challenges on the rules. Uh, we have a, you know, a still, uh, how should I call it, imperfect housing finance system, uh, dominated by the government, but also not that good at providing credit where, where people could responsibly borrow. And we left the firefighting tools of the, of, the, of the central bank and the government weakened, weakened in reform. And uh, those are you know, things that are gonna burden us for some time as, as choices. At the core of the reforms, though, um, we did the necessary essential thing, the most valuable thing you can do to protect, to make an economy less vulnerable to these things, which is we made the basic constraints on leverage, uh, on funding mismatches, much, much more conservative, and we expanded their scope much more broadly. You know, in the U.S. economy in 07, the U.S. financial system in 07, banks were about 40% of credit, and they were the only institution really subject to any meaningful constraint on leverage or funding. So our, our, our uh, safeguards, our, our protections were very narrow in the application. And uh, they were narrow in the application in part because they were tough enough to encourage the migration in that period of optimism and boom of a lot of risk outside the core of the banking system. So today those safeguards, those shock absorbers are much, much more conservative and they're applied much, much more broadly not universally, much more broadly, 
And of course, the, in a system like ours, which is sort of unique in the level of competition we allow with banks, that does create this inexorable dynamic over time as optimism comes back that uh, those tougher safeguards create more incentives for risk to migrate outside the core of the banking system in the future. And that'll present some challenges for us to come. I think that's a suitable note on which to open to questions, which I'm sure there will be many. Um, no questions? Surely. Ah, Philip Cogan. Mr. Buttonwood has a question. Um, thank you. Um, what do you think of the bill to audit the Fed? And um, I'm guessing you'll be against it, but what controls, given the powers of central banks, given that Mario Draghi saved the euro and that the uh, UK brought in Mark Carney, rather like um, hiring, hiring Lionel Messi to Manchester United with extra salary and everything. What, what democratic controls... That's probably the nicest compliment to Carney yeah. I've heard. <laughs> and he's taller than uh, Messi. Uh, what, what controls, what democratic controls of, over central banks should there be? Um, you know, Ben Zane referred to this at the beginning, this will disappoint you, but I, I, um, I'm very careful not to... Um, uh, not to, at least I try to be careful not to comment on the policy choices of my successors or about current policy things like this. Uh, you know, generally, I think um, people should look with skepticism and askance at efforts by um, by politicians to constrain the independence of central banks. We've got uh, centuries of experience with how those end how those come out, and it's just been a tragic experience. And uh, so most countries that have embraced uh, this basic idea that central banks should be independent, not in the goals they're given, but in how they achieve those goals, uh, has, a, has a, lot, a lot for it. Um, so I guess I'd leave, it, I'd leave it there. So independence doesn't mean you know, independence on everything. You know, the government should retain some authority of what are the objectives the central bank should pursue, is asked to pursue, but they should give them some flexibility in the means which they pursue those, because we learn from experience that to subject that, those judgments to politics uh, typically ends badly. One more question, because um, then I think we have to go to lunch. Uh, gentleman right here. Yep, another front row question. Thank you. Uh, this will be a quick one. Speaking of central banks and uh, the importance of independence, the SNB obviously surprised everyone within a few days of saying something. They lost all confidence. Any quick thoughts on that? Why they would talk about the cap and then take it away, and if they ever get their confidence back in what they might be uh, doing to do that? That's, that's kind of uh, too close to current thing. Ask me something different. Uh, I mean, I could okay. talk about that, but it won't be interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in a way that is not the SMB. Does it make sense for central bankers in general to do, say something and then two days later do the opposite? And, uh, okay, second. I'll give you a general lesson in life. Uh, think, think, you know, you've you, you got to judge these choices relative to the alternative. It, like, it's, it's, it's easy to look at something and say, oh, that seemed kind of strange. But try to put yourself in their shoes and ask themselves, what would have been a better choice? And there are lots of commitments in finance that are hard to soften responsibly that can only be broken. I mean, that's, that's, a not, that's not a very nice way to say it, but you know, you know, you know, if, if you, you know, you, the idea, if you, if you soften it, you may magnify your exit problem, <laughs> magnify your, your thing. So that's, that's, a, that's a soft. We can infer what you think of them from that, I think. <laughs> Tim, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>